Good morning and welcome to the 2021 Annual Conference. I'm Emmy Smith, Director of Professional Development, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the conference keynote address. As a reminder, if you would like to turn off subtitles, press the live transcript button located on the bottom right of your screen and select hide subtitle. At this time, I'd like to turn the session over to AILA's Executive Director, Benjamin Johnson. Thank you very much, Emmy, and thank you all for being here. And I'm very happy uh, that uh, we are here with the Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas. Secretary Mayorkas, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. My pleasure, Ben. Glad to be here. Um, you know, I want to quickly note that, you know, next week is the ninth anniversary of DACA, um, which means that it is also the ninth anniversary of your first invitation to speak at the annual conference, uh, annual conference, which uh, I keenly remember you had to cancel. I remember you calling me, I think, on my cell phone the day before saying, Ben, I can't come, um, but I think you're going to be okay with why. Uh, and, and we were okay with why you couldn't come to, to the event. And it was really a Marvelous opportunity. We put that uh, press conference up on the big screen. We all watched it. So, um, you know, you can always feel free to make major announcements or even skip our invitations <laughs> to make major announcements in the future. So anyway, I, I know that was a, a proud moment for you. So let me just do a quick introduction. I suspect you don't need uh, much of an introduction, but I'll give you one anyway. Uh, Secretary Mayorkas is just the seventh confirmed Secretary of Homeland Security, and he is the first Latino and the first immigrant to hold the office. Born in Cuba, where his family arrived as refugees, uh, some from the Holocaust, he and his family arrived in America in the early 60s as refugees from Cuba, uh, from the Cuban Revolution. We were raised primarily in California, and he went on to become a federal prosecutor and eventually serve as the youngest U.S. attorney in the country. He served as the director of USCIS for four years, where, among other things, he led the development and implementation of DACA. And he oversaw the changes that came along with the establishment of marriage equality, two really landmark events uh, over the last uh, decade or so. He would go on to become the Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security, where he served for another three years and was then appointed to be Secretary of Homeland Security uh, by President Biden. In the interest of time, uh, Mr. Secretary, I'm going to skip the many other accomplishments and simply submit for the record that you have had a very long and distinguished public service career, and we're grateful for it. So now, Mr. Secretary, I think what we want to do is turn the floor over to you uh, for any comments you want to make, and then maybe we can have a back and forth with any time that's left. Uh, ben, uh, thank you so much, um, and good morning to everybody. I, I am uh, um, plugging in from Los Angeles, California, where I'm going to meet with um, uh, members of the uh, advocacy community later today and engage in uh, other endeavors on behalf of the department. Uh, today and tomorrow before I head back to, to D.C. Uh, you know, I agreed to, um, uh, to engage with uh, this organization, I think, for three reasons. Uh, number one, uh, I have tremendous fondness for the relationship that uh, I've had uh, with AILA over the years, um, predominantly when I was uh, the director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and I, I hold the organization in high regard, and its input has been critical uh, to the work uh, that I've done and tried to do and the work ahead. Secondly, I think it um, continues to be critical and it always will be to understand um, the needs and concerns and issues uh, of the public uh, whom we serve. And um, Ayla, of course, is representative of that uh, public. And third, um, uh, and certainly not least, uh, is my... Um, uh, respect for and friendship uh, with um, the leadership of Vela and Ben Johnson. Uh, you know, um, the first time I met um, uh, Ben, he gave me a very, very hard time uh, on something uh, that we were doing at USCIS, and he was 100% right in doing so. And uh, from that point on, we forged a, um, a great friendship of which I am very proud. And, um, and uh, that brings me uh, here uh, this morning to all of you as well. You know, uh, we've made, I think, some significant changes in the Department of Homeland Security in the, um, uh, in the immigration space. Um, and we've also made some changes that might not appear to be significant, 
uh, but I think are quite uh, fundamental. And I want to cite just two, and then I want to uh, really just jump into the conversation uh, with Ben. One is, and I, you know, I don't know uh, how much publicity it has received, uh, but uh, we issued uh, very significant guidance uh, to the uh, Office of the Principal Legal Advisor at Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And that guidance spoke of the responsibilities of a lawyer for the government, uh, not to win or lose a case, but to do justice, but to do immigration justice. And sometimes, um, uh, as we unfortunately know, uh, that means looking across the courtroom at, at a child who is unrepresented in immigration proceedings, which I think is an abhorrence uh, uh, in our system, and uh, identifying what those rights uh, of the child might be and bringing them forward to the court. And so when we have an individual who is unrepresented, uh, the burdens and obligations on an OPLA lawyer are even more significant than otherwise is the case. The second thing is actually a change in language. Um, we no longer permit that uh, we issued a directive that no longer permits the use of the term uh, illegal alien when representing an individual um, who uh, has unlawful presence in the United States. Um, unless we are quoting uh, or citing to directly uh, the statutory language that uses that terminology. Uh, we um, now, from this point forward, will use the word non-citizen. And I think it speaks to the respect and dignity uh, of each uh, individual whom we encounter in the system. And I think it, it is a harbinger of more changes that will come uh, that you will certainly learn about. So with that, Ben, um, I'm, I'm ready to, um, uh, to engage in a conversation and I'm looking forward to it. And thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Let's see if we can uh, continue our, our history of good, challenging, respectful dialogue. <laughs> so let's start then with uh, Biden administration's record on immigration so far. Um, and to your credit, let's, let's start with some of the, the wins. There have been some significant ones. The change in tone and rhetoric is dramatically different. And I think uh, this, this change in the language around uh, um, non-citizens is, is not, it's, it's important. Uh, those kinds of things can have a lasting uh, effect. They matter. Um, a repeal of most, not all, most of the executive orders, uh, the establishment of sensible, humane enforcement priorities. You're right, much more stakeholder engagement. Your respect for that is, is, is well known and it's reflected in the fact that I've had more conversations in the last six months uh, with folks uh, in the administration than I've had over the last four years. Termination of MPP, OPLA memo, some real, some real solid uh, uh, changes that, that are important here. But the success of many of these changes is going to depend on how they play out in the field, right? The memo is the beginning of the process for change, not the middle, nowhere near the end. You know that. Uh, you, you've got tens of thousands of, of folks working in DHS. How confident are you that these changes will make their way to the ground, to, to, to where the rubber meets the road? What steps are you gonna take to make sure that they do uh, um, you know, land where they, the way they need to land in the field and with your, with your staff? So, so Ben, um, uh, number one, I, I, um, uh, the buck stops with me uh, with respect to uh, what has lived on the ground and whether the policies that we promulgate, uh, the guidance that we issued is actually lived um, on, the, on the street, if you will. Um, and you and I both know, I think we all know that there have been times in the past when good policies uh, have been issued uh, and have not been lived by the people uh, whom they've uh, been uh, directed uh, to and whom uh, they impact. Uh, so that starts with me. And leadership um, is not uh, only one individual, but it must be cascading. Um, I believe in leadership. I believe in management. I believe in supervision. And I believe in the people to follow the directions uh, that we provide. I am very confident um, in our success. And I think we're also uh, uh, going to be piloting uh, new things um, uh, and exploring uh, new opportunities uh, with respect to 
uh, some of the some people who will um, help execute the policies. For example, at US Citizenship and Immigration Services, um, I want to uh, uh, pilot having immigration lawyers as um, uh, specialty adjudicators. Um, and that will, I think, enable a number of different steps to be taken uh, to address some of the challenges that we've encountered in the past. For example, you know, when I was an assistant U.S. attorney handling very, some very, very significant cases of national significance, um, you know, I would, I'd be on the phone with the uh, lawyers uh, for the targets of the criminal investigation or the defendants of uh, whom we already had um, uh, begun to prosecute. Well, uh, one of the concerns that we've had is uh, a non-lawyer adjudicator speaking with an immigration lawyer, and is that uh, um, an efficient and fair uh, relationship, if you will? Well, we'll, we'll we're going to pilot some immigration lawyers um, in USCIS who will be able to uh, pick up the phone and say, you know, Ben, we don't see this third element satisfied. I don't need to issue you a um, an RFE by carrier pigeon. Uh, I'm going to, I'm just telling you right now, I don't see uh, this third element satisfied. You tell me where it's satisfied. You'll either succeed or fail in doing so. And I'll tell you, you'll fail and you'll need to file something supplemental. And we're going to dispense with a lot of the RFEs and the Byzantine back and forth that plagues the efficiency and um, frankly, fairness of the agency. So, and we'll supervise that and we'll manage it and we'll try and sometimes we'll succeed and sometimes we'll fail, we'll, but we'll always get better. Wow. Okay. So that's a, that's a bit of a, that's a bit of a sea change. Um, and so I'm, that's very uh, interesting and exciting uh, to hear. Um, and I don't want to uh, stay on the negative, but uh, I, I would, uh, I mean, it, it sounds to me like you understand the important role of lawyers on both sides of, of this system uh, and that to achieve both the right outcomes and to do it efficiently and, and fairly, you need to have lawyers on, on both sides. And so the lawyers, both within the agency and within the uh, immigration bar, play really critical, important roles. But I mean, what you're talking about is upending a system that unfortunately, in many, many ways, doesn't recognize that important role. I mean, we routinely have lawyers who can't file certain applications online on behalf of their clients, uh, file G28s and uh, not able to get the interaction with the agency. So, I mean, is, is that, uh, it sounds like your intention is to sort of undo some of those inefficiencies uh, and, and sort of exclusion of lawyers in, in, their, in the important role that they play. Oh, sure. Um, uh, of course, I'm going to, in, um, you know, my goal is to undo the efficiencies and overcome the obstacles. Uh, but but let, let me be clear, just to, to make sure there's no misunderstanding. I'm not going to replace the USCIS workforce with immigration lawyers. I'm going to add immigration lawyers to that workforce. Um, and, and remember one thing, the adjudicator has the responsibility, the responsibility to make sure that the law is applied fairly and justly uh, and efficiently. The immigration lawyer uh, represents an individual or an entity and, and is an advocate. Um, and um, so I, I just want to make that make that point. But access, access to justice, uh, efficiency in the administration of justice, um, those are the uh, principles uh, that we're going to pursue. I think there's a place for immigration lawyers in the adjudicative arena that will bring uh, greater efficiency. Uh, to the process. I believe in the USCIS adjudicator, and I think we need to give that adjudicator better tools. Um, technology uh, to replace carrier pigeon, email, phones. Uh, I mean, so, some of the things that I think are elementary. Yeah, that, there's no question about that. I, I, we might have a chance to get into some of those details, but as I, I think I mentioned to you, I got a ton of questions from ALA members and a lot of them dealt exactly with that. And to your credit, you made clear you didn't want to see these questions in advance. You wanted to have a, an open dialogue about that, but there were definitely questions and concerns about the absence of emails, uh, you know, communication. Uh, the 800 number is, you know, seems like an unmitigated disaster for, for most of the folks that are using it. So I, I think continuing to lean into that is going to be critically important, at least from, from the side of uh, ALA members in figuring out how to, 
how to how to build this system back. But your point is a good one. We also have share the respect for the the, the adjudicators. They play an incredibly important role. And I hear what you're saying. This is just about finding opportunities for efficiency using the skills of of the you know sort of lawyer to lawyer communication. Um, or 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 even adjudicator to lawyer uh, communication, uh, but uh, you know within parameters and and guided. You know, look, I mean, this is this is not new. Um, uh, I talked about this when I was a director of USCIS. Why are we mailing an RFE? Uh, let's assume, by the way, that the RFE is necessary. But why are we mailing an RFE, getting a mailed uh, uh, response back? If there's any supplemental questioning, mailing those supplemental questions, why can't we just pick up the phone and call? Why can't we send an email and the like? And the concern was the completeness of the immigration file record. I don't. I think that uh, uh, needs to be overcome and should be overcome. There may be other concerns from a legal perspective of which I am unaware. I will become aware and will tackle. Them. Well, that that is really that is that's that's great to hear. Um, uh, and I, I do think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, as with many of your initiatives. Uh, that's bold. Um, and I think we, but we are ready to work with you to figure out how to make that happen because we share the frustration with uh, the, these RFEs. I mean, I think on our end, there's a lot of questions about the need for the RFE on the, on the, in the first place and to compound that what seems like an unnecessary RFE with the delays related to mail and the, and the inefficiencies of communication, I, I think just compound a problem uh, over and over again. So I look, we look forward to, to working with you and figuring out how to make that happen at the scale that it would have to happen. Um, so let's, let's talk about, um, let's talk about some, what I think are some missed opportunities, uh, maybe some delays in decisions that we had hoped to see uh, from the administration. Um, and, you know, I think they began with, you know, really what I, what I thought was, I think others felt was sort of an anemic response from the Department of Justice on the TRO related to the, the uh, removal moratorium. I thought that was an important part of the, that early agenda uh, with, you know, the non-immigrant visa ban, uh, the executive order was left in place until it expired. The travel bans uh, yet to be lifted, expulsions are still happening at the border. There was, I thought, just a you know a terrible flip flop on refugee numbers. So there have been some miscues uh, uh, over this this first stage of the of the Biden administration, and, and I think the response has been uh, on your part certainly that look there was a scorched earth, earth strategy with the Trump administration, and it's going to take time to build back. But I, I will say to you, it feels to me like some of these delays and some of these miscues are more a lack of resolve. Uh, and and to push through the political pressure. So let me ask this: One, are you have you built a foundation now where we can expect or you can expect to see change happening at a faster pace uh, than has happened before? Right? Um, are we on the right trajectory in terms of building back and being able to make change? And are do you are you satisfied that there is a commitment within the administration writ large to really lean into all of the changes that it was uh, seeking to achieve? And so a couple of things, if I may. Uh, first of all, you, you, um, you identified a number of things um, at, the, at the very beginning um, that are distinguishable from one another. I, um, so I, I, uh, I, I, caught, uh, I, I caught them and I, I would probably tackle each one, one by one, yes, sir. Uh, but let's not, yes, sir. That'll, you know, that'll consume all of our, all of our time. Let me say this. There is no shortage of resolve. Uh, there is no compromise in commitment. Uh, I can cite to you um, some of the pronouncements and guidance memos that have issued in the past about which there was tremendous enthusiasm and about which there was tremendous disappointment in the days that followed the announcements and the directives. And it goes to your point at the very beginning, you know, um, okay, so what are we gonna live as opposed to what are we gonna read and what are we gonna hear, right? And so sometimes hmm. uh, change does take time. That's, a, that's not, to, not to say that every single passage of time that we have endured over the past just four months, by the way, uh, um, 
um, uh, is perfectly right, okay? Uh, but change takes time. I'll give you a perfect example. On January 20th, we issued um, uh, new enforcement guidelines on day one. They were revised on February 18th. I am uh, overdue in issuing my uh, enforcement guidelines. Why? Because I've decided that it takes time to get it right. I am traveling around the country, meeting with ICE personnel, meeting with members of the community, and I want to get it as right as I can in the first iteration of my guidelines. And I'd rather be right than fast. All right. I mean, I, I, that's hard to argue with. Um, and I, I, I hear what you're saying. So my grandmother used to tell me about being a Catholic, right? If it's, if it's easy, you're not doing it right, right? So I, I hear what you're saying. Um, this is hard to do and you'd rather these things land. I guess the question is in the interim, are you thinking about safety net measures um, uh, that, that would allow for uh, protection of those folks that are sort of, that, that are gonna get stuck in this in-between time um, and, and fall out of status, get uh, removal orders, all of those kinds of things. So are you committed to, to, to instructing and creating safety nets uh, to, to protect folks during this interim period? Very attuned very attuned to that. Um, uh, look, I mean, I am uh, taking the time uh, that I am with the enforcement guidelines, for example, because the February 18th guidelines are actually being executed effectively, not perfectly, but quite effectively. Um, and I think the results speak for themselves in that regard with respect to the individuals whom we've apprehended and against whom uh, we are seeking removal. Our numbers have increased with respect to uh, true public safety threats, and they have dropped with respect to individuals whom immigration justice would suggest that they not be uh, removed. So, the, and you've talked about the OPLA memo, which I think includes some really important provisions that I, I, again, I'm hoping that you are confident that they'll take effect immediately, because one of the challenges that we've seen with regard to uh, removal issues is the sort of hesitancy to stipulate to uh, issues in removal proceedings uh, to, to, you know, alleviate some of the backlogs, but getting cases off, you know, finished in, in, an, in a reasonable period of time with, they don't need to be uh, fought over for a long time. Um, motions to reopen, all of those things, I think, are critical to figuring out uh, how to, um, you know, how to keep people from falling through the cracks as you as you as you construct something that's going to be long lasting. So, I mean, is your read of the OPLA memo is it an affirmative statement that those stipulation efforts, that those, you know, joint motions to reopen in, in certain cases, is, is that your expectation that that will be happening on a on a on a more efficient and effective basis? I think if a, a motion to reopen is warranted, uh, the OPLA lawyer uh, should not oppose it, uh, just to oppose it um, uh, because of a perception that the proceeding needs to be a, a adverse. Um, it is, uh, we, we should be adverse to a position that we consider to be unjust and aligned with a position that we think is just. Uh, and I do think that's going to take hold, but I also want to, you know, speak up for the workforce, uh, that uh, policy ping pong is not easy. Um, uh, I, I've been through it as a, as a career uh, government uh, uh, official. Um, we, we went, you know, from uh, the, the workforce went from a, the Obama-Biden administration to the Trump-Pence administration, and now to the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, there are dramatic changes uh, um, uh, that have come already, more to come and operationalizing it and uh, changing uh, uh, muscles and even culture um, takes time. And uh, I know you cited a relative. I, uh, I cite um, uh, uh, the famed uh, UCLA basketball coach, John Wooden. Be quick, but don't hurry. I like that. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I in, in preparing for this, uh, I did prepare. Uh, 
Um, I went back and I listened to your 2014 annual uh, conference keynote in Boston when you spoke to uh, the ALA, had a chance to finally speak to the ALA community. And you quoted Burger v. United States uh, and the prosecutor's obligation not just to win cases, but to pursue justice. Um, and what I hear in you is a sort of is a reaffirmation of that and a belief in that. And I think what you should hear from us is, uh, you know, extreme enthusiasm in figuring out how we can help you uh, and support the, the, that effort, because I do think it would be critical. And I think it would to get prosecutors out of the bureaucratic and into the pursuit of, pursuit of justice uh, would be an enormous benefit to everybody. I think that's um, the obligation of a, of a government lawyer, not just a prosecutor. So um, let me, I said we, we talked briefly before we started that I wanted to, I want to get to some border issues, the stuff that's been on the, on the front lines, uh, front, front pages uh -huh. of newspapers and everywhere, and uh, you've had to answer a lot of questions out. But before I get there, I want to talk about some things that often get missed and that this venue provides us a unique opportunity to talk about. We've touched a little bit on it, is these backlogs and inefficiencies, the RFEs and all of those kinds of things. So um, as part of the Stopgap Stabilization Act that Congress passed, I mean, I know that there's been some recent announcements on measures to uh, alleviate backlogs, uh, some, some really good steps related to uh, RFEs uh, and two-year EADs, all of that will help. But that, that Stabilization Act required a five-year plan to reduce backlogs. It was due uh, at the end of March. Um, is that in the works? Have you seen it? Do we, do you, any, any sense of when that longer five-year plan uh, might, might emerge? I had a, um, a very extensive engagement on this very subject um, two days ago. Could have been three. I think it was two days ago. Then here's the challenge. Uh, we're we're going to get it done. Let me just, let me put the marker down. But here's the challenge. We're dealing with um, an agency, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, that was gutted uh, uh, during over the last four years. It's um, was financially devastated, uh, and I think uh, everyone is aware of that. And to reduce the backlog requires resources that the agency does not have. On the one hand, personnel several thousand personnel. Um, on the other hand, uh, the financial means to hire those personnel, let alone overcoming um, uh, burdens and barriers that were imposed you know, by the prior administration. You know, we issued, our, uh, as you well know, USCIS issued an RFI uh, for, you know, about burdens and barriers, and there were more than 7,000 responses. 7, 000, more than 7,000 responses in a very short period of time. There's a lot of work to be done and we have to resource the agency appropriately. And we talked about that and we talked about what that means in terms of resources to address the backlog and do everything else that we want, including being innovative, uh, uh, as, I, as I referenced at the outset. Well, you know what that means? That means a fee rule. There hasn't been a fee rule for that agency, I think, in six years. And so on the one hand, we need a fee rule and we will promulgate a fee rule that will involve cost increases. What is the tolerance for cost increases? If we don't increase them appropriately, we won't get through the backlog and, and address all of the other goals that we have. And so that's going to require discussion and a lot of engagement. I, I hear what you're saying. Resources are important. Um, uh, you know, part of this Stabilization Act included the ability to expand uh, the numbers of services provided through the premium processing, which we come yep. at, at, a, at a higher rate. I will say the that- The volumes aren't, the volumes aren't shaking out enough uh, uh, to hire 3,000 people. Right. Uh, and, and we're conflicted, I will say, the membership about these premium processing. Because I mean, again, as you say, at some point, if everybody's you know, paying the premium processing, that is the processing, that is the filing fee effectively. So, but I think the other piece of this is that we have seen fees go up in some areas, which, you know, naturalization uh, being one of them and, you know, a dramatic increase in services and no return on that investment. The, those processes continue to be incredibly slow. 
And there is the concern related to fees that what about those folks who aren't going to be able to afford that? Are, are you willing to, to, to lean into ideas like, is there any room for some direct appropriations for some of these services to cover some of the baseline uh, uh, costs related to this? I mean, continuing to try to, to, to pay all of this through, through fees feels like a, a failed experiment at this point. So, so we've sought uh, $345 million in fees. Uh, when we raise fees, uh, the public uh, deserves uh, the uh, commensurate um, improvement in service. There's no question about it. Uh, in looking at the fee rule and looking at what the agency needs, we have also looked at a robust uh, fee waiver program, understanding um, uh, the reality of disenfranchisement and our obligation uh, to overcome that and make sure it doesn't persist. So we're looking at all of that. You know, an appropriation may seem like a panacea, but it also brings risk to the agency because it's year to year. And it's very difficult for an agency to, to, to build dependencies when uh, the flow of funds are not necessarily assured at the level required year to year. So I think it's a combination uh, of appropriations and, um, and fee calibration. Or, I mean, but, I but we're about. very, very aware, Ben, sorry, very well aware of um, financial obstacles to benefits for which individuals uh, qualify. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, I can tell that people are very happy about the uh, what you're saying by the numbers of texts I'm getting or, or messages I'm getting on my phone. I had to put my phone on a on a napkin to keep it from buzzing here. So uh, I, I, I have learned I have learned well enough from you and others that the quantity of messages does not necessarily reflect enthusiasm. It's the substance of the messages. Yes. Well, I, again, I, there is a, I mean, you're hitting all the right buttons in terms of recognizing the things that you're, you're doing. And I think we're, uh, you know, prepared to go into uh, these, these changes uh, with an open mind and, and be supportive. We will hold our, our uh, negative skepticism to the side. And, and, Cause I think you have proven uh, that you can uh, deliver on key changes, but it's going to well, be. He, a, he, can I, can I, can I say something yeah, about that? Please. Because actually the, the, healthy skepticism and um, is a, is a um, productive force. You know, uh, um, Ben, when, when, uh, when you, for example, when you keep the heat on, uh, you know, our friendship is never at risk. Uh, 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 it's, uh, I understand it's, it's your obligation to keep the heat on. That's, that's your, 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 your role. Um, I, I, uh, I embrace that because um, uh, I'll, I'll push back if I think it's undeserved, as you know, and uh, I won't push back, uh, but turn around and say, you know, you know, to my colleagues, well, what about, what about this? You know, why? Why, why, are, why, are, we, why are we doing it uh, this way? I, I, um, I embrace that. I will tell you that, you know, just, you know, bottom line, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not particularly interested in um, impacting um, um, incrementally, uh, unless uh, that's what uh, success requires. Um, you know, hearkening back to what I said about it, sometimes takes time depending on the change that one wants to one wants to implement. But I'm I'm interested in really um, accomplishing fundamental change, significant change. That's that again. That is that is great to hear. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure we will be able to deliver on uh, the healthy skepticism part of that then <laughs> and as a catalyst for change. Uh, so let me talk about an area of healthy skepticism uh, in terms of my membership, which are uh, travel bans, Title 42. Uh, I think the conflation of uh, health related issues and immigration issues. Now, obviously, when the Trump administration issued many of these travel bans and uh, exercising authority under uh, Title 42, um, it was, you know, in the context of, uh, you know, four years of, of, of rhetoric about immigrants bringing diseases and them, and, and them being a threat to the country. Um, and at the time that many of these travel bans were announced, there was skepticism within the CDC community about 
the, the benefit of these turnarounds or the, the inadmission of, of folks other than non-citizens. Um, so, I mean, one question that came to me, I'll just sort of read it directly. Why is the Biden administration treating a public health crisis like it's an immigration crisis? If an individual in India or elsewhere can present proof that he or she is otherwise legally authorized to enter the US and has either been fully vaccinated or tested negative for COVID within 36 hours before entry, that person should be admissible regardless of whether he or she is a US citizen or a non-immigrant with a valid visa. The fact that we have one standard for US citizens returning home from abroad and one for non-citizens seeking uh, lawful entry makes no sense as a response to the pandemic. So what kind of dialogue are you, I know a lot of that is outside of your control, but what kind of dialogue are you having when, uh, as these, these restrictions continue to ease, we have not seen any easing in the, the, these other kinds of uh, immigration related bans. What's the timeline on this? So uh, the timeline is um, uh, defined by the public health imperative, pure and simple. This is not a matter of immigration policy. It's a matter of public health um, uh, requirements. Uh, that's the predicate of it. Uh, you know, uh, whether the prior administration uh, used it uh, as a tool uh, uh, for alternative purposes uh, is something uh, that I'll leave uh, for others. But I can tell you uh, what we are doing and what we speak of and the fact that we review uh, the public health situation all of the time. I, I have to tell you, I mean, let me, let me ask the following question. Are we free and clear of COVID-19? Because I don't think the answer is yes. No. And as long as the answer is not yes, we have a responsibility to take a look at the public health situation and do um, what is best uh, uh, for the American public. And uh, while adhering to our values and our principles. The fact of the matter is we don't have open and free travel between the United States and the European Union. So it's not an issue uh, of immigration. It's an issue of public health. We are, our borders are closed between the United States and Canada for non-essential travel. That's not an issue of immigration. That's an issue of public health. Uh, we are dealing in a global uh, environment where there are variants and um, uh, complexities uh, on the public health landscape. Uh, it is not a matter of immigration policy. It's a matter of medicine. Well, in... And I understand and it has, I understand its implications for people. I, I know that, uh, you know, um, I, I understand the international implications. Task forces were just established uh, to look at uh, travel with respect to certain countries. I'm going to be in Mexico um, arriving Monday evening to talk about uh, the fact that um, uh, only essential travel uh, is permitted uh, between our two countries, understanding the economic impacts of that, but nevertheless uh, addressing the public health situation and where we're headed. But I'm not going to uh, identify an arbitrary timeline, which is a matter of medicine, which I am ill equipped to do, but it's based on science, on data, not um, arbitrary calendar dates. We're moving here with urgency. Well, I would, again, I would expect that we would expect that as these uh, restrictions in certain countries uh, get, get lowered, that the, the same would apply to the immigration process. And in the meantime, one thing I would point out is there are some exceptions uh, to these restrictions, national interest ex exceptions. Um, and the agency doesn't seem to be as dedicated as it needs to be to get those uh, exceptions evaluated. Uh, the CBP for a while was reviewing those national interest uh, uh, exceptions, uh, has stopped doing that. It's, it's left a real hole in the process in terms of trying to get those uh, exceptions in front of the agency, either State Department or, or DHS CBP. Um, so, you know, we're not, we're making a really bad situation worse by not paying attention to all aspects of the ban, which include the exceptions and, and not just the exclusions. Well, um, I'll tell you um, what CBP has done is it has um, uh, uh, effectively administered the suspension of Title 42 with respect to unaccompanied children. Um, it uh, takes a look at exceptions to the Title 42 um, uh, uh, architecture that remains with respect to families and single adults, and it makes exceptions for um, individuals with acute vulnerabilities. I think we're doing what we can uh, uh, we are 
are not doing it perfectly, uh, but I will say there is um, no compromise to the integrity of our efforts. I thank you. Um, I, I hear that. I hear that passion, um, and I have the frustration in my ear. But I understand. Of course. Understand, um, what's what's at stake here? Um, lives on both sides, though. Uh, I think you know that that the folks that are. Uh, returned, expelled, um, not only are denied an opportunity uh, for a review of a potential uh, claim uh, of persecution, uh, but they are returned to the streets where they have absolutely no protections uh, against uh, the, the diseases that we're seeking to protect. So there are grave, grave consequences uh, anywhere around uh, and all around this situation. And those weigh heavily on us. So let's talk uh, about border issues a little bit more I and mean, come to, to MPP issues. But I want to start from the proposition that I think that there are two really huge issues uh, driving. Uh, it's a complex issue at the border. You, you know that better than, than anybody. Uh, you've been handed this just unenviable task of sorting through all of that and dealing with all the pressure, political and otherwise, that comes from it. Um, but I think at the heart of it are two huge issues. One is detention policy and the other is immigration court backlogs. That's a driver of a lot of how people are reacting and, and, the, and, the, and the faults in the system. On detention policy, I will say, it's not the position of Ayla, this is my belief, uh, this system is addicted to detention. Um, it's addicted to detention because of the existence of private prisons who use money and influence to keep the system addicted to detention. Um, there is funding for bed space that turns into demands that those beds be, be filled. Um, and there's a desire, I think, in the political space to, to show that we're getting tough on, uh, on immigration, these consequences and detention then is used as a, as a political weapon rather than uh, as, an, as an effective enforcement weapon. And all this happens when we know that alternatives to detention are both more fair, more uh, uh, efficient and, and less costly. Um, so where do you stand on that? And where, when are we going to see, I've seen the closure of some facilities, but still the ongoing uh, use of detention. Um, and so talk to me about what your, your view is on, on detention related issues. Then um, identify for me, if you will, um, the time before um, these last couple months when two detention facilities were closed because of the manner in which they treated uh, individuals in custody? It's been a very, very long time. Um, I'd like to know when. I don't remember it. Maybe it happened, but I don't remember it. And I, I communicated when we closed those two facilities uh, that, that, that and, and my memo speaks to this, um, that that wasn't, um, uh, the be all and end all of it, that we're going to take a look at the treatment of individuals in facilities. And not only that, we're going to look at the placement of individuals in facilities um, to understand uh, whether um, uh, they belong in detention or not. I will tell you, um, and there will be individuals in disagreement with me, um, there are individuals that need to be detained because they pose a public safety threat. And those individuals will be detained. Um, and um, uh, I have heard arguments to the contrary, and I have not heard an argument that I have found to be persuasive with respect to the continued detention of individuals that pose a public safety threat. Um, I also think uh, that detention is overused and um, we're going to be tackling that. Mr. Secretary, I agree with you. There, there are situations where detention uh, is, is warranted. There are folks who pose a public uh, safety risk, but I am absolutely confident that if we reduce the size of the detention population down to the people who pose a public safety risk, you would be able to close many, many more detention facilities. So it really comes down to the question of how do you build into a system a willingness to really honestly and truly look at whether and when there is a public safety threat, because that's not happening right now. Yeah, uh, Ben, I, I also am, um, uh, I, I understand, um, uh, you know, how much detention 
we need is something that is uh, being studied based on an understanding of the factors that require someone to be detained, as opposed to why in the past they've been detained. Okay. And listen, I understand your, your hands are tied by a set of laws that are, uh, you know, are, are, are really ineffective and inefficient. We have been in this country engaged in a discussion about, uh, about uh, criminal justice reform you know, not, not long enough, but we're in the middle of that conversation. And I think part of that conversation needs to spill over to our immigration system because in our immigration system, and again, I understand this is not within your authority, but our laws still require, you know, not just three strikes you're out, but one strike you're out, um, you know, and, and, and rules related to mandatory detention um, that tie your hands. Uh, but there are options that are available uh, despite those uh, horrible laws. Um, I hope that you will be an advocate for the criminal justice review and reform that's happening elsewhere to be happening within the immigration uh, system. I know that you are, and I hope that you will continue to be. Um, and I hope in the meantime that we will look to the authority that you have uh, to release, uh, to agree to bond, stipulate to, uh, to, to, to bond in cases where it's warranted, to have alternatives to detention. Our partners at the Immigration Council with the clinic did a, an incredible survey uh, there is an entire ecosystem out there uh, available for uh, the, the agency to take advantage of, uh, to have case management systems and other alternatives to detention that are going to reduce uh, 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 failure to appear rates and reduce the inefficiencies of the current system. Very mindful um, of those studies, of the data, of the empiricism, that people who actually understand uh, the process, who uh, do have guidance, uh, of individuals, counsel, and others with knowledge um, uh, have a far, far higher rate of appearance in court, uh, that um, non-appearance is not uh, necessarily a reflection of absconsion, but rather just a um, failure to understand an extraordinarily difficult system and complex system that we all know fundamentally needs to be changed and the laws need to be passed to change it. So, well, first I want to stop, and I, because I'm going to go into another area of, uh, of, of potential tension here, but I do want to acknowledge, you made a good point. The closure of those facilities uh, is a big deal, and your uh, attention to this, the, the, the problem of the detention, the acknowledgement that it's overused uh, is, is worth noting and, and for me acknowledging and thanking you for uh, that commitment uh, that you have. Uh, oh. I appreciate it. Uh, no, no, thanks. Uh, or, or this is an obligation. All right. So now the love fest will end uh, because <laughs> apropos that was short lived. <laughs> that was short lived. Uh, apropos of what you just talked about in terms of representation issues, uh, the immigration court backlog issue. Now, you, there has been a recent announcement about a dedicated docket meant to alleviate some of uh, that that immigration court backlog by dealing with folks you know, asylum seekers, uh, recent arrivals uh, on a dedicated docket. And all due respect, and you know what happens when I say that, um, we, we've been to this rodeo before. How is this not a rocket docket? How, how can you possibly achieve fairness in a system where you've acknowledged that we haven't got the representation access thing right? Um, the Trump administration has gutted the asylum laws such that when you get to the moment of being able to have your case heard, you're set up to fail. Um, so I understand and, and, and appreciate and support the idea of a streamlined process, but a streamlined process and without addressing those fundamental failures is just a rush to a denial. So how is this dedicated docket gonna work any differently than the other rocket dockets we've seen in the past? Um, I think, uh, uh, Ben, first of all, um, uh, I think undue delay um, in the administration of immigration justice um, is unfair. Uh, it's unfair to the individuals in the system and it's unfair to the system itself. And it is our responsibility when we uh, move uh, uh, to be more efficient, to move faster, to uh, not compromise fairness. And that's our commitment. And I wouldn't prejudge the program until the program is lived. Uh, it, we, we can, uh, I don't find um, a six-year period uh, between um, 
uh, making a claim and a final adjudication to be fair, to be fair to anyone. Um, uh, and I think that is um, uh, quite frankly, a significant infirmity in our system. Um, and if we can deliver fairness uh, in a year or under a year, then that is an improvement. But fairness um, is the foundational principle here. But justice delayed is justice denied, pure and simple. And I am well aware of the policies of the prior administration that we need to change. But I wouldn't prejudge it just because it's a dedicated docket and um, it, it brings the clouds of the past as opposed to the opportunities ahead. I, I think we have, we, we um, give us a chance. And if we, um, we come up short, then, then, then uh, the repercussions of, for us, um, we will, will have to address. Fair enough. I mean, we have, my staff knows, I say this all the time, you know, it's, there are times when it's, where you, you can and should disagree and commit. So I agree with you that, you know, I, I have my, we have our doubts about this dedicated docket, but we will disagree and commit to its success. But there needs to be an understanding of some of the foundations that have to be addressed in order to achieve that success. Uh, I know that there is a commitment in this, this plan to, to LOPs and, and know your rights, uh, but the capacity to deliver that doesn't exist yet. Uh, there is a, a pro bono uh, component of this. There are folks who are never going to be able to afford a lawyer and they're going to need pro bono representation. But the immigration bar, the private immigration bar, plays an important role as it does in the criminal justice system and every place else. All three of these avenues of uh, access to justice and representation have to be uh, uh, developed. And that doesn't exist now. Uh, we still have huge problems of access to counsel, being able to engage with clients. So the system's going to have to be able to uh, to be flexible enough to address those fundamental failures as we move forward. I think that's fair. Okay, uh, in terms of uh, EOIR, I just want to quickly say, or quickly ask, are you in communication with DOJ? Is there, uh, is there, a, is there an awareness or, or conversation about the important role that they play in doing this? 1.3 million, million cases in the backlog. Uh, our, our study showed that fi almost 500,000 500, in, the, in the, the on the docket and are pursuing relief through USCIS. Is there a conversation being had about taking those cases out of that backlog? Because uh, otherwise, this dedicated docket is just going to turn those abominable uh, three-year, four-year periods into six-year and ten-year wait periods uh, as EOI resources are diverted to the uh, to the dedicated docket. Yes. Um, and we need to move faster. Okay, um, we a couple of few more minutes. So uh, MPP, um, a lot has been said ab about MPP. Uh, it was recently finally terminated. Uh, that is is a huge uh, thing. Um, and, and again, um, you know, recognition and congratulations are, are due on that. What's the goal for ramping up the process of bringing people in? Uh, do you have a target date? I know you're not a fan of target dates. Do you have a target date, though, that you might be looking towards in terms of being able to, to clear this MPP backlog? And importantly, and this is true with a lot of other areas uh, that I probably have, should have mentioned, we know that part of this justice denied is we got a lot of people, both in MPP scenarios and elsewhere, with, uh, with final orders. Um, and we have a system that is blind to and resistant to uh, a consideration of, of motions to reopen. So will those cases be part of the MPP uh, admission process? Uh, and how are you addressing uh, these, you know, these injustices that have occurred and, and resulted in a final order? You know, Ben, I, uh, let, me, let me say this. I, I think we are moving as quickly as we can um, we have opened up an increasing number of ports of entry to process individuals um, who are subject to MPP, uh, you know, who have active cases in MPP. And quite frankly, the architecture that we built to do that is an architecture that will serve us very, very well in the future. You know, the, the ability to register virtually and to coordinate with NGOs 
uh, south of our border to work with the government of Mexico, with UNHCR, IOM, other organizations, and, and bring people to the port of entry in a safe and orderly and humane way. I think that's a foundation for the future, not just for MPP, uh, but uh, more broadly. Uh, the, the issue of uh, final orders has not been resolved. I, I have to tell you, um, it's a complex issue. Are, are, we going to, are we going to reopen every case that was adjudicated over the last four years with finality? I, 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 it's not an easy issue. I understand. I understand the reason why people say yes. I understand the reason why people say yes. And I also understand what a yes would actually mean. And then we talk about all the other things that we've talked about thus far in this conversation, Ben. And what is the impact on the system of saying yes? with respect to everything else. I, I just, I, you know, I, I would welcome the opportunity to sit down and talk about this discrete question and go through all of the factors and the complexities. In an ideal world, uh, if we don't have confidence in the justness of a decision, we'd open, we'd open the decision up. That is quite a sweeping measure that has consequences not only with respect to applicable standards for reopening, but it also has just incredibly significant repercussions for everything. Everything we're talking about. Yeah, I understand that. And and listen, we're we're we'll, we'll accept that invitation to sit down with you and uh, and think all of these things through and and figure out a way forward. You you make a, a, an important and completely valid point about strains on the system, but as as you know, um, you know, well, I, I think mean, skeptics you know, skeptics should look no further than the Supreme Court decision relating to the issuance of NTAs to see just the, the, the foolishness that goes on with those NTAs and the idea that we cannot understand and forgive people who were victims of those kinds of foolishness. That's the low hanging fruit here that we ought to at least commit ourselves to being able to address. Look, uh, look, look I mean, let me, let me just, um, let me take it a step further if I may. Um, um, with respect to public safety threats, uh, those are, um, mostly, you know, predominantly defined by criminal history, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I have been criticized for importing the injustices of the criminal justice system, the infirmities of the criminal justice system into the immigration system by relying on criminal history because of, you know, the, the racial injustice and other uh, uh, challenges in the criminal justice system that have come to the, um, uh, you know, to the fore in our in our public discourse. Can I dig into every criminal conviction to determine whether it was just or not before I make a public safety determination? I, I will tell you, we're done. I, I, we're just done. So if for you know if we are aware, if we become aware of a conviction's infirmity, that's one thing. But are we going to engage in a uh, 2255 analysis of each underlying conviction to determine whether it was just in order to determine whether the individual is a public safety threat with three prior felonies? I mean, we, we, it's, so this is, the, the, these issues, uh, I understand the equities, I understand the underpinnings um, the the realities are very complicated. Listen, I, I've been around the system long enough to 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 recognize all of what you're saying, but I, I you I am unsettled by the idea that true case by case review is beyond the reach of the immigration system. That may be true, but that is a that's a truism that we've got to unwind. And the other thing I would point out is that with the, these independent systems of immigration and criminal system, the the immigration system gets a second bite at the apple. And even in the absence of a full conviction or service uh, in, in any time in jail, that person can be subjected, treated as an aggravated felon and subjected to 
to uh, the life sentence of, of removal. So it seems to me that if independent determinations can work against the alien, that independent determinations can work in favor of the alien where the criminal system uh, has failed or gotten it wrong, at least as it relates to immigration law. So what, what, what do you mean by an independent determination? An independent determination of what? Well, of the case, the facts and circumstances. To, the, okay, whether so I've got an individual, I've got an individual with three felonies. Is it my is it my obligation to dig in to the criminal record of each felony to determine whether the conviction was just? No, it's the system. If so, I'll do six. If, if so, we'll do about three to five cases a year. It's I don't sure. I don't think that's right. I do think it is the system's obligation to provide that person an opportunity to be heard about the nature of those convictions. Uh, nobody's asking that you do de novo reviews of all of the nature uh, of, of those convictions, but an opportunity to be heard in front of a of a separate and independent tribunal, at least independent from the from the from the criminal system about whether those three convictions were for 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 shoplifting in order to feed a family. Um, those are relevant to whether uh, that person is of course. A, a, a safety threat. So, of course, a full fair no opportunity to be heard you know, should not be out of, out well, of range. Um, don't they have that opportunity to be heard with respect to a removal proceeding? Well, they don't if they don't and, have and, access. And, and shouldn't, the, shouldn't the enforcement and removal operations uh, officer take a look at the nature of the convictions? Of course they should. And if it's shoplifting, then is that a, uh, an individual uh, um, who uh, deserves our allocation of, of limited resources, the, the shoplifter, as opposed to uh, the serious sex offender who, who might not frankly be covered by the aggravated felony determination, which I find to be a, um, uh, not uh, the perfect vehicle for the determination of priorities. I think that's right, and 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 this I'm I'm past uh, my time with you, um, and, and I, I know you have other places to go. But that that this I hope this dialogue uh, will continue, uh, and I guess I would say that all of these conversations, and I suggest all of these changes, probably at one point felt completely out of reach within the criminal justice system to undo three strikes you're out, to undo the you know mandatory sentencing that those systems become so accustomed to and built processes around. I believe that certainly working together with uh, you, the private bar and other stakeholders, that we can create a scenario where these kinds of opportunities are achievable within the system. As you say, it will take time and commitment, but we're ready to have those conversations and make that commitment. We are too, Ben. Mr. Thanks Secretary, thank you so much for being here. I, I, I feel like I owe you an opportunity for any final uh, comments that you want to make, um, but I just want to convey to you uh, before then that how grateful I am for all, all that you have done and for sharing your time with us today. But please, the uh, floor is yours for any kind of final comments. The, the, the gratitude is, um, is reciprocated. I um, admire and am grateful for your uh, advocacy, Ben. Thank you. Thank you, Ben and Secretary Mayorkas for this informative and engaging discussion. This concludes the keynote address. Join us at 1130 a.m. Eastern time for Hot Topics with AILA National Officers.